Welcome everyone to today's Foxconn quantum computing seminar. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having Philip Verdoy-Lunel, uh, who will talk about permutation tests for quantum state identity. So Philip is a, like he finished his PhD under Harry Berman and Florian Spillman at the CWI Amsterdam, uh, finished recently, and will be starting postdoc uh, at Sorbonne University uh, with uh, Alex Grillo. Uh, so his research is mainly in quantum cryptography uh, with some particular interest in quantum position verification schemes. But he's also interested in uh, the applications of semi-definite programs to different uh, problems in quantum information. So Philip, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Galo. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm happy to talk here to everyone. Yeah, so my name is Philip. I indeed recently finished my PhD. I uh, actually defended my PhD last week, uh, last week, Friday. And, oh, uh, congrats. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. And next week, next week, Monday, I'm going to move to, um, to Paris to start my postdoc there. Um, yeah, so... I'm going to talk today about something called uh, permutation tests for quantum state identity problem. Uh, this is joint work with my former supervisor, Harry Burman, who was a professor in Amsterdam, still is, but he now also is, uh, has joined a Continuum, which is a quantum startup in London. Uh, Dimitri Grinko and Jordi Begemans, who are both PhD students at CWI and at QSoft. And indeed, I normally, my, most of my work was in the area of quantum cryptography, and um, uh, with a particular interest in quantum position verification. And in my work, I used some uh, usage of semi-definite programming to show that certain attacks on cryptography schemes were optimal. And, and one day I was talking to my colleague Jordi and we, we realized that some of these semi-definite programming techniques we could use for this quantum state identity problem. So I, I feel that these semi-definite programming techniques are really a hammer and, you, and, you, and I'm trying to find nails and this quantum state identity problem turned out to be a, a nail for it. OK, so let me start by introducing what we mean with quantum state identity problem. Please, by the way, if you have any questions, you can just interrupt me and you, you can ask. Um, so this I'm, I'm first going to give a sort of loose definition of quantum state identity problem, and then I'm going to give a more formal definition of, of what we really mean. But consider if you have two classical strings, um, it's very easy to check if a certain bit in one string is, is equal to a certain bit in the other string. That's what I sort of depict here, that, that, that just say you have two strings, y1 and y2, and you, you can just check if certain bits are the same. So I could have the following problem, namely I either give you two strings that are the same, or I give you two strings in which one bit is different. Then you can just check bit by bit until you find a, a, a different bit. This unfortunately doesn't really work like that for um, quantum input. So let's say I give you two inputs, Psi1 and Psi2, um, and they are either equal or orthogonal, and I ask you to figure this out. Then you cannot start measuring the qubits uh, case by case because, well, first of all, the basis uh, in this case wouldn't be known, so you, you, your measurement wouldn't, be, wouldn't necessarily learn you something. And this is the start of a famous protocol called the, the swap test. So in the swap test, um, I think initially it was only for qubits, and, and, and most of the time in this talk, I, I will only talk about qubits. Um, so the swap test is as follows. You, you, you get this an in input, you get um, two states, Psi1 and Psi2, I call them here. Uh, and I give you the promise that they are either going to be equal, so you're either going to get Psi Psi as an input, or one of the two states is orthogonal to the other. Right, so Psi1 is orthogonal to Psi2. And then the task is to find the best measurement that distinguishes between these two states. And you can prove that the optimal measurement to do this is the so-called swap test. And we're going to look a little bit into detail what this swap test does. Uh, I think it's it's a fairly well-known thing, but, but let's uh, uh, recapture it. So we use an ancilla qubit initialized in the zero state. Uh, we apply a Hadamard to it, and then we apply a controlled swap. 
and then we apply a Hadamard again, and then we measure this qubit. Uh, and we're going to analyze in detail what actually happens to the underlying state. But the idea is that if your input was equal, then you're always going to measure a zero here. And if your input was orthogonal, then you're going to measure either a zero or a one. Um, and you can actually prove, and this was done, I think, in the initial paper already, um, and, and it was later in, uh, extended, that the swap test is actually the, the optimal test that can distinguish between these two cases of either equal or orthogonal input states. And then it, I think it's in the 50-50 input, uh, input regime. And it was proved under the so-called perfect completeness requirement. And perfect completeness here means that um, you're never allowed to say um, unequal inputs when the inputs were actually equal. That, that is sort of the scenario where these things were proved. And, and indeed, this, the swap test will always answer equal on equal, imp to, on equal inputs. So that's a property of the swap test. So what happens really under the hood here? Um, so the initial state is this 0, Psi 1, Psi 2. Then we apply a Hadamard to the first qubit. You're going to get 0, Psi 1, Psi 2, and 1, Psi 1, Psi 2. Then you're going to control swap the state. So we're going to be at this point. So you're going to get 0, Psi 1, Psi 2, and 1, Psi 2, Psi 1. And then you're going to apply this final Hadamard gate. And then you need to reconfigure it a little bit. But you're going to get the following final state. Uh, on the 0, you're going to get Psi 1, Psi 2, plus Psi 2, Psi 1. And then you can add a superposition with 1, and then Psi 1, Psi 2, minus Psi 2, Psi 1. So what you can already see is if, if Psi 1 is actually equal to Psi 2, this state is going to fall away. These are going to add up, and this half perfectly cancels. So you're going to get 0 Psi Psi. That's if, if they're equal. And so your measurement output is all, measurement outcome is always going to be 0. And then what the swap test does, it says, OK, if you measure 0, we're going to answer equal. And if you measure 1, we're going to measure unequal. And then. The idea is that the swap test is only wrong uh, when you measure zero, when the inputs were actually uh, orthogonal. So that if the inputs were actually orthogonal, you're going to get this final state. And then, yeah, you can see you can you can see that the, the probability to measure a zero in this case would be a half if the inputs were orthogonal. Um, so in that case, the swap test is, is going to be wrong. And then. You can already ask yourself, well, what if we sort of generalize this, right? So here the inputs were two qubits. What if we get n qubits? And then maybe a, a subset of those n qubits is going to be orthogonal to the other subset or um, in some way. And this is exactly what this problem uh, talks about. Uh, and we're going to uh, formally define this in a moment. Let me first describe the two types of errors that, that, we, that we talk about here. So there, you, there, there's going to be false positive, which are so-called soundness errors, and false negative, which are sort of completeness errors. Uh, and, and here, the positive case is going to be that all the input states are the identical uh, states. So, so, so no states are orthogonal. And the negative case is going to be if, if some states are orthogonal. And then, um, you can, then you're going to get that this, what, like I mentioned before, that, that perfect completeness means that you don't make any mistakes when the input was the po positive case. So that means no false negatives and, and the positive case, so you're not going to answer negative on it. And then you can compute the average. What we're sort of interested in, in for these protocols actually is the, is, is the average success probability. So with some probability, you're going to get the positive case and you want to, uh, and then you want to multiply this with the probability that you identify it successfully. And then with some probability, you're going to get the negative case. And then you want to multiply this with the probability of answering successfully in this negative case. All right. Uh, so excuse me, uh, do, do, yes. you, do you assume that all the states are either identical or orthogonal to each other? Yeah, so the, the swap test, the, the inputs are either equal or, or orthogonal. Yes, exactly. Um, and I'm uh, going to no, define I think the... In, the, in the swap test, uh, we, we can do arbitrary things. We, we can just measure the probability of uh, zero and one, and then we can measure the inner product of psi one and psi two. Yeah, you, you're right. You're right. So the swap test, 
for us, it, it, it estimates the it can estimate the overlap between two states indeed. But how it was initially phrased was really for this specific problem where they were either equal or orthogonal. Um, okay, so that, that that's your promise. Yeah, so I, I I consider really this equal or orthogonal orthogonal case. I, I think I'm I'm gonna show you in the I next see. slide. Uh, can I follow up with that? Yeah. So any reason? So in some sense, I guess this is essential. You needed the promise that if it's not equal, it will be orthogonal. Yeah. Uh, uh, because I mean, I guess like. Is this like sort of the more interesting case or what's sort of the motivation uh, for having this kind of restriction? Well, I think if you go back to the swap test, if you have this uh, promise, then you can just do one shot and then you can immediately tell whether side one and side two are identical over orthogonal. But if you don't have that oh, promise, okay. Yeah, so at if least you don't it's sort have of like promise, the most interesting a, case, I guess. Yeah, you have to do a lot of shots to determine the overlap. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's a highly specific problem. But the, but there there have been yeah, there are there are scenarios where you where you really think about this. Yeah. So I, I guess uh here our motivation is to res restrict uh our, ourselves to uh to a more specific uh scenario. And then we can maybe just use uh, a few shots to determine uh, uh, whether they are identical or not. And yeah. but I, I think it's, it's still very useful because in many uh, communication protocol, yeah, you probably just use uh, identical or orthogonal states. Yeah, or, or you can have some algorithm that outputs some states in 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 one case, and it outputs an orthogonal states in another in another case, and then. Sometimes you you continue with with these states in in a quantum algorithm setting, for example. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let me phrase how we specifically think about this quantum state identity problem. Um, so as an input, we're given n unknown states, so psi one up to psi n. Okay, I said qubits, but uh, they can actually be of any any local dimension um, that are are pairwise orthogonal or identical that that's really how we how we think about it in in this setting so no sum overlaps or, or for, for how our, our proofs to work in they're orthogonal or identical and then i'm going to give you some sort of different problems of this quantum state identity problem that each are sort of uh, less restrictive uh, more restrictive yeah so like i said the promise is they're either all identical or we're going to have one of the the following promises. The first problem is sort of the most general case. That, that's just saying that there are going to be indices where uh, the inputs are orthogonal. Um, then the second problem um, is the case where there's going to be some partition. So you're sort of going to know what states, how many of the orthogonal states are going to be there, but they're going to be permuted in some way that is unknown to you. So then the state is going to look something like this. So you're, you you have your n input states. There's some ran you don't know the basis of these input states. So there's some random unitary applied to it, but you do know that there's going to be mu one of one state, mu two of an orthogonal states, mu three of another orthogonal states, up to d of these these states. And then one can also think about the case where you actually do know the order. So there's going to be n states. They're going to be in a random basis, and you uh, know that the first mu, so mu one, mu two, those are just th those are just numbers. They define a partition. So you know that the first mu one states are orthogonal, are orthogonal to the uh, the second mu two states. So so they're either all equal, or you know that sort of blocks are orthogonal, and you need to distinguish between the two cases. And then all these cases. Um, there can be some prior p, so the, the, the prior p defines uh, with probability p, I give you the all identical states and probability one minus p, I give you one of these, these promises. And then the task of this quantum state identity problem is to return equal in the first case and unequal in the second case. And we're interested in maximizing uh, somehow a, 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 a protocol that, that, that maximizes the probability of answering correct. Are there any questions about this? Uh, 
yeah, need some time to process. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> the different cases. Uh, uh, so I think the uh, first the 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 first one is easy to understand, right? The pairwise orthogonal. Yeah. yeah. And so what is the difference uh, of the second one? Uh, so in the first one, you there could be just one state orthogonal, right? So in the in uh, if if you have n I, if you have n input states, the first one oh, just tells you there there can be one of these is going to be orthogonal, but we don't know how uh -huh. many. And in the second case, you're also actually going to know how many states are going to be orthogonal. So either all identical, or we know how many are orthogonal to the rest. So maybe it's easier to think of this partition mu that can just be a partition into two sets. So in the swap test, there's, there's there, there there are two inputs. They're either equal or one is orthogonal to the other. But you can also consider 10 input states and then, then you know, for example, that they're either all 10 are equal or maybe seven are orthogonal to the other three. Oh, I see. Okay. And then, ah, yeah, like the, the, explicit so example the, is very useful. <laughs> so the, so the this, this, this second problem is saying that you know that seven are orthogonal to three, but you don't know how they are, what, what the location is. So, the, so these 10 states, they're permuted in some way that is unknown. Okay, okay. So for, for the case that the seven states uh, are orthogonal to the three states, and so are these seven states orthogonal to one another as well? No, 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 no. So it's seven equal states and three orthogonal states. Oh, okay. And those three other states are also equal to each other. I see. So yeah, you so have that, two that's kinds the, of states. Yeah. So in the case where you have a. Uh, uh, um, a partition of two sets, yeah, there's only two different states, but you just don't know the basis, right? So that means that this mu1 is going to be 7 and this mu2 is going to be 3. And then some random unitary is applied, so they're they're rotated to some random thing, and you don't know this unitary. If you would know this unitary, the problem would, of course, be easy, because you can just measure in that basis. But the whole, the whole point is here that you don't know this unitary. I see, okay. And then the third case is is is, is the most loose case, where you actually know the location of these thing. And then you can permute it yourself. So you can say, okay, well, they're either all 10 are orthogonal or the first seven are equal and they're orthogonal to the next three states. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. I see, I see. Yeah. So there are at most two types of states. There one. No, so uh, there, there can be our, 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 our protocol will work with as many as you like. Um, but, uh, but, but there is one like uh, identic identical states you are focusing on, and the other are also going on to the original one, because you have some. Yeah. You you only have mu two. The partition is can be only two partition at most, or you can it can be many partition. It can be many partitions, and then within all these partitions, the states are equal. But between partitions, they're always orthogonal. Then why do you just focusing on that mu2 greater than zero? What, what does that so sentence mean? Oh, sorry, mu2 greater than zero just means uh -huh. that there is a partition. So if mu2 would be zero, they could be all equal, right? But um, so this, this mu2 here means that, that the partition is sort of not all the same states because that, would, that would, wouldn't make sense because then that's already the first promise, right? That they're all identical. So mu2 bigger than zero just means that there is an orthogonal state. I see, I see, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I hope the, the setting is clear. Um, okay, and now I'm gonna introduce something called the permutation test. And this was introduced by uh, Kada Nishimura and Yamakami already in 2008. And the permutation test is a generalization of this of this swap test, where you where you're going to have n n input states, um, and where the swap test sort of made a superposition over uh, just a single swap, which is like all the it's actually also all the permutations. But just if you have two inputs, you can only permute them once, and then that's all there is. This this permutation test is going to control make a, uh, a superposition over all possible permutations. So you you um, yeah you you have some Fourier transform, then you control over all these states, then you control over all possible permutations of these states, then you do a Fourier transform back, and then you're going to measure. And you can show that this permutation test um, 
is optimal for arbitrary inputs to, to this problem um, under the perfect completeness requirement. So it's this requirement that you're never allowed to give false negatives uh, in the case the input was, uh, yeah, that you're never allowed false negatives. So you're never allowed to say unequal when the inputs were actually equal. And it's fairly efficient. It used to, uh, you only need a Fourier transform on, on n log n qubits. And uh, up until now, uh, this optimality uh, of this permutation test was actually unknown if we relax this perfect completeness requirement and we just say you want to maximize this average success probability. Uh, and, and furthermore, what they do in this uh, paper, they uh, consider also other tests besides the permutation test, so the so-called cycle test, where you don't uh, make a superposition over all permutations, but only over um, the cyclic group, basically. So instead of the old permutation group, you, you make superpositions over the cyclic group. Uh, and, and, and the advantage of this is that you need much less uh, ancillary qubits and your operation is, is much easier. And then um, you can also show that this is sort of optimal in a uh, worst case setting where only one state is orthogonal. That's sort of the most difficult setting always. Uh, and there actually this, this cyclic test is also optimal. And then there was uh, later work uh, by uh, by a group in Paris, and there they consider the case where there's actually only one state orthogonal to the rest. It's uh, this called this psi in, and and then they sort of assume that you can make as many as you like of some sort of orthogonal states, and then you can keep on doing swap tests. So you you, you do a swap test on the on the two input states, and then if the state says orthogonal, well then you stop. You know that the that the states are orthogonal, but if it says equal, you can do a swap test on the output. Of those states again. You can keep on doing swap tests and it's nice because this actually uses no ancillary, uh, it uses no quantum Fourier transform. I mean it, you actually need to do some Hadamard uh, to do the swap test but that, that that's it so it's, it's much more efficient but it only works when one state is different from the rest. So let and me clarify, try, try to clarify what you say. So for the left uh, plot uh, you 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 said you you only need the cyclic shifts. Yes. Uh, so it, so is the functionality the same as a uh, previous one? You as the permutation the, test. Yes. No no or so because are... no so this this cyclic test doesn't generate all the permutations right so if there's for example only one state um, orthogonal mm -hmm. then indeed it does generate all the possible permutations because this one state just sort of gets. Uh, permuted everywhere, but if you have uh, some different partitions, so if you have some orthogonal, some amount of orthogonal states uh, compared to the rest, the cyclic test is not going to generate all the partitions, uh, all the permutations, and and that's sort of clear from the next example, right? So let's say your input was zero one zero one zero one. Oh, sorry, this last zero shouldn't be there. Then what the cyclic test will do, it it, it can only make two. Sorry, forget that this zero was here. So it can only make two permutations, right? So it can make, yeah, where the first uh, first state was a zero or where the first state is a one. So actually here, the cyclic test will, will not work that well, but it will work relatively good when, when the inputs in this case would be bunched. So if it would be zero, 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 and one, 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 you see that you can make oh, actually eight permutations. But uh, then, then what is the cyclic uh, shift good for? So the cyclic shift is uh, is good uh, when the amount of orthogonal states is very low. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. And 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 what you want is you want sort of your um, the, whatever um, group you're going to use to to generate the uh, the permutations of. You want to sort of intuitively maximize the number of permutations that is possible with your input. So if you know nothing about your input then what you can do is generate actually all permutations, which is this permutation test. But if you know a little bit more about your input, you might want to use mm -hmm. uh, a smaller group that's, that the implementation is going to be easier that still generates a lot of these permutations. And that's exactly where, what our work is sort of about. I see, okay. Um, okay, so some of the open questions um, I mentioned already before, what if one relaxes this perfect completeness requirement? That was one of these uh, questions in the original paper of the permutation test. Is the permutation test still optimal? Um, are there, besides the permutation test, simpler approximations based only on uh, swap tests? And more fundamentally, what is the underlying structure that 
allows you to achieve optimal performance with with these simpler tests? How can you really how can you investigate what I'm describing earlier with the cyclic test with with low amount of orthogonal states and it sort of works good? Can we can we mathematically refine that? And then we also think a little bit about what performance you can get beyond the worst case inputs. Um, OK, and now the punchline is that um, there exists an optimal test for the quantum state identity problem for all priors and all type of allowed errors uh, for all these different problems that I was describing. So this 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 most uh, restricted case where you only know that there is an orthogonal state or where you're allowed to uh, know how many there are, but you don't know the permutation or where you actually do know the, the permutation. And for all these tests, the optimal test is in fact the, the permutation test in, in a sort of very general uh, setting. And the key structure we do is, the key structure we needed to use is the, the input symmetry. And we, um, yeah, we, we look in, very, in big detail to, the, to this input symmetry and we use uh, uh, to advanced tools from, from group theory and representation theory to, uh, to show that the permutation test is optimal. Um, yeah, so like, like I said before, you, we, we, we're thinking about these permutation, permutations groups, so it can be the cyclic group, and the, those, are, those are all subgroups of, of the symmetric group, which contains all the permutations. Uh, and, the, and, and, and you can use sort of representation theory of these groups to, to, to get like analytical results for, for how well a certain test would do under a specific group. Um, and so our main theorem is the following, like I just said before, so this, this optimal test. The, there's some P star that, that's sort of not important. It's going to be a very, very small P star. Uh, but for priors higher than this P star and for any partition, uh, input partition, the permutation test is, is going to be optimal for all these quantum state identity problems. It will always achieve perfect completeness and it has soundness one minus one over the multinomial coefficient uh, and mu, which is defined as follows. And this this p star is sort of a weird quantity. It, it it's a very small number, and below this p star, so the the p the p is the prior with how, what probability you're going to get the all equal or the orthogonal input. Below this p star, it's 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 going to be a better strategy to just always say um, unequal. Uh, so. The, be, be, because you're you're going to give the the equal input with such low probability that the best strategy is to do something very stupid and just always say I got actually the the orthogonal input. But above this p star, the the best thing you can do is to always do the permutation test. Uh, sorry, can, can you remind me uh, what is the perfect completeness and soundness? Yeah, so perfect completeness means that you're not allowed to have any false negatives. So on the equal input, you always have to answer equal. Uh, and, and soundness is the probability that you um, answer wrongly on the unequal input. Uh huh. I see. Okay, so so you. perfect comp uh, completeness means uh, you don't have false positive. Uh, uh, Right. No false, no no false negatives. Oh, oh, false negative, and yeah. soundness means uh, what? The pro probability. The soundness is the probability of a false negative. Yeah. I see. Okay. And, and so what we know already is that this this swap test, for example, has already built in this perfect completeness, right? And we could show that this swap test was optimal when you had this perfect completeness requirement, but our proof doesn't assume perfect completeness, uh, that, that, that the protocol has to have perfect completeness. We, we just maximize the probability of doing the state uh, perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that the optimal protocol that the, uh, up, maximizes probability has, perfect, has perfect completeness. So yeah, so we, we get it as a, as a side thing, so yeah. Okay, and here P is uh, your prior probability? Yeah. Yeah, so okay. it's the probability that you send in this this equal input or this input where uh, there, there there can be orthogonal states. Okay, I see. Uh... So I can, I, let, let me give you a little warm up of of this theorem. So mm -hmm. 
consider the case where we actually only have a partition of two sets. So there's there's going to be uh, n minus h states uh, that are equal, and there's going to be h equal states that are orthogonal to the other n minus h states. And this h can be anywhere between one and then n over two. It's, n over two is just because the first partition is always the biggest. And let's assume that I'm going to give you 50-50 inputs. So they're either going to be equal or they're going to be uh, orthogonal. Or, or they're going to be, these H states are going to be orthogonal to the rest. Then this permutation test is, is optimal, as our theorem imp uh, implies. Um, and it has perfect completeness. And then the, the soundness is as described there. So the average success probability, because in this case it's this 50-50 input, is going to be 1 minus 1 over 2 times this binomial. When when h when when mu consists of a partition of two things, it, it this just becomes the binomial. And choose h. Right. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, the case I was describing before. So um, the, the the swap test, the the, the well known case. Then your uh, your input to total input is going to be two. So n is going to be equal to two. Uh, and one state is going to be orthogonal to the other one, right? So h is going to be equal to one. And then you can see that the success probability for n equals two and h equals one, you're going to get one minus one over two times two choose one. So that's one over four. So you're going to get three over four, which is exactly the probability of the success probability of the swap test in this 50 50 input case. Uh, and we can also consider the case where. You know you're gonna get uh, like k times just you can, the swap test. That that's often what what so, sort of papers do. They uh, they they you're gonna get a a case where you have a single uh, where where you would normally apply a single swap test. So you you want to check if two states are orthogonal. But then I'm gonna give you this k times, and you could apply the swap test k times that has success probability one minus one over two to the k plus one. But you could also apply this permutation test to the total set, where actually there are two k uh, input states, and k of them are orthogonal, and that will have success probability, uh, yeah, two n choose n, as our theorem implies, and that grows a little bit faster to one. I mean, it, quite a bit faster, but of course, asymptotically, they're both <laughs> going to be exponentially uh, converging to one. But yeah, this is so this this quantity is going to be optimal. Is it clear? Uh, by op optimal, you mean the success probability is optimal? Yes. So we we maximize the success probability. Okay. I see. So yeah, this 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 you can prove. You you cannot. You, there does not exist a test on these inputs that has higher success probability than this. Because because yeah, our test is completely optimal. This permutation test. And I'm going to go into into a little bit of detail why 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 this is the case and how we prove it. But first, some some interesting conclusions from this theorem is that um, I, I I sort of sketched uh, the second and third problem in the state identity problem where in in the one case you know the or you don't know the order of the inputs you just know how many states are orthogonal to the other and in the other one you do know the order but but actually knowing the order does not allow you to achieve a better uh, success probability. Mm -hmm. Because this permutation test is always the best test to do, and it's, it's agnostic. It, yeah, you, you're, not, you're not using any of these inputs, uh, of, of, these, of the knowledge of this input in, in, that, set, in that setting. Um, the second thing we found out is that relaxing this um, perfect completeness requirement, which, which also is sometimes called one-sided error requirement, does not increase this average success probability because we still see that the permutation test is optimal both in the perfect completeness setting and both in the general setting. Um, and sort of the worst case indices are always when there's there's going to be one orthogonal state and 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 the rest is going to be equal. Um, but the permutation test is going to perform a lot better when there's a little bit more of these orthogonal states. So that's sort of the name of the game. Then you have this binomial that's going to grow very quickly uh, when, 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 yeah, when you have a, a better partition. So the, so the number of orthogonals, the number of or these orthogonal states is what's going to make the, the big difference in, in getting your uh, 
in, in, in better distinguishing the two, the two cases. And how do we prove this? Um, so we, we write our problem as a maximization problem. Uh, and uh, you want to find the best measurement that maximizes the effort success probability. And finding this measurement, you can write as a semi-definite program. Um, and then you can show that the, the permutation test, I mean, it's obviously going to be a, a feasible measurement. So it's a feasible solution to your semi-definite programming. The semi-definite program always has a primal problem and a dual problem. And in this case, the primal problem is a maximization problem. And whenever you fill in um, a feasible solution to your maximization problem, it's going to give you a lower bound to the real value of your, pro of your optimization problem. But then you can look at the dual problem of your STP and your any feasible uh, solution to your dual problem is going to give you uh, an upper bound to your maximization problem. So you're going to sort of get two things from, from this uh, semi-definite programming. And we actually make a, a, an educated guess for this dual problem. And this educated guess relies highly on representation theory that is actually equal to the uh, to the feasible solution of the permutation test, the, 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 val the value it implies. So we get that the value, we, we find two points in the prime on the dual space with equal value, and then weak duality implies that this permutation test is actually optimal. Uh, in this case, we're actually the inputs were, were higher random. And then we use some more work that we actually show that this higher random inputs where, where sort of, that's, I'm talking about what basis you pick, that if you pick them higher random, it's actually the most difficult case, uh, which is sort of logical, but yeah, you need to, 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 to do some work for that. So how would something like this look? Let's, uh, let's Sorry, can I ask yeah? the clarification? So what do you mean by the hard random there? How do I make yeah. sure that it's orthogonal? Uh, sorry. So uh, this unitary here, where I'm saying we don't know the basis. Uh, oh, OK. We, we assume that this unitary is hard random. But mm -hmm. and that you know, that's, that, that's sort of what we often say when you know nothing about the basis. OK, well, you pick it to be hard random. but it could be in some sort of weird setting that actually, uh, if it was from some different distribution, the problem would get more difficult. But we actually show that higher random is the most difficult one. Um, yeah, so consider again this, this case where, 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 the in, where you're giving 50-50 these inputs of equal and, and unequal. Then what are you interested in? You want to find a POVM set, P equal and p unequal that maximizes this quantity here this is sort of a often used quantity uh, where where rho equal is the density matrix of, of having equal inputs and rho unequals have, is the density matrix of having unequal inputs and you can you can compute these density matrices uh, yeah by integrating over your your higher measure of, of, of equal inputs or where there's some orthogonality uh, implied that's sort of this assumption and then we show that that for any of these uh initializations of your uh, of mu the yeah this this permutation test is is the optimal solution uh for for this problem so you can fill in the permutation test in your primal and then for this jewel we show that that the, the value you you get is e equal to this permutation test and because this permutation test doesn't care about any of this it doesn't care about the order it doesn't care about how many of these orthogonal states there are? It's 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 the optimal test in any of these cases, and actually knowing this order doesn't help you. That's sort of an interesting uh, conclusion from it. Yeah, and 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 what sort of is crucial to this proof, but but I'm not going to go into it today, is that you can row an equal state. You can uh, write it um, using representation theory with um, something called Koskan numbers. And and for the symmetric group, the you, you, you need to compute some some certain representation theory quantities that you can actually compute easily. But when you would optimize over some different groups, so we, we said for example the cyclic group and the cyclic group you can also compute it, but over some different group it's not immediately clear how to compute these numbers. Um, so when you generalize the statement I made before where this permutation test is optimal, you, you can consider like how well do other tests apply. So this, this cyclic test, like I said before, or, or this, this other uh, swap test. 
And you can write down the statement for a general group G where you can say, okay, well, I have a G test measurement, which where your where your pi equals actually this pi G, where you sort of project to um, the representations of uh, of this group, and then yeah, you get a sort of representation theory quantity here. It's kind of a I, I won't go into it. It's, it's it's kind of a difficult thing, but in order to know how well your test works for a specific group G, you want to compute these two quantities. And this is in general a very hard thing to do. But in case where your group is the, for example, the cyclic group, you can compute these things. Or when it's the uh, the all possible permutation group, you can also compute these things. Um, exactly, like I said so before. So the permutation test, you you can compute these things, and for the cycle test, you can compute these things. But but what you would somehow what what would be interesting is, for example, if you can. This is a, a something called the iterate, iterated cyclic breadth product. I'm gonna give you an example. You immediately understand what it means. Um, it would be to compute um, the following. Like so, the, so this this iterated breadth product is if you would continue to apply swap tests to all your inputs through all your quantum inputs, and then on the outputs of that, you keep applying swap tests to, to check if um, states, uh, to check if there's going to be an orthogonal state. So this is like a very easy implementation, we would we would think, like it's maybe very hardware friendly. You can use it with maybe beam splitters. I'm, I'm not an expert in this experimental setting. Um, and basically this theorem says you can compute exactly how well, uh, how well this test would work if you would know these quantities for this group, the, iter the iterated breadth product of uh, the cyclic group two with each other, and then the cyclic group two are, are, are these guys. Um, but this is actually very difficult. So we, we have no idea how to compute this iterated breadth product of these of these of these swap trees but yeah our, th our theorem says that if you could compute these quantities then yeah then you can compute the exact performance of, of this test um but uh an, an an open question in this original paper from 2008 for this quantum state identity problem was how well can you do this qsi problem when you're when you're just using these these swap tests so uh, we, we come up with this test ourselves where you sort of keep on doing swap tests to, to your inputs. So we, we were kind of interested to see if we can still compute something about these swap tests, right? Or about, about this, this thing which we call the iterated swap tree. And, and like I said, you can analytically compute it, but yeah, we, we have no means to do that, unfortunately, now. Um, but we propose a way where we compute the performance of this iterated swap tree by sort of counting the number of times where the swap test can work. So you can imagine if there's only one state orthogonal, let's assume it's this Psi 1, and all the other states are actually equal, then this swap test and, and this permutation, let's just forget about it. It's, let's just assume that, uh, we're, that, that it's identity. And, and, and only this Psi 1 is orthogonal to the rest. Then this swap test, this swap test, and this swap test are never going to say anything else than equal because we know that all these inputs are equal. And only the first swap test has probability <coughs> half that it's actually going to say unequal. And then this swap test is going to have probability half that it's going to say unequal. And then this swap test is going to have probability half if, in, in the case where you measure equal all the time. So you want to sort of count to, to analyze the performance of this count how many of these events there are where the inputs are actually orthogonal, these input lags to a swap test, how many of them are actually orthogonal. And we propose a recursive way to compute the number of these clicks. Um, and actually we, actually, we don't compute it exactly. We give a, a, a lower bound uh, on the number of these clicks. And, and, and it sort of makes sense. You're sort of, you're sort of saying, okay, well, take your initialization. Um, the, the, this theorem actually only works if, if your partition is into two sets. So, so your mu is just n, this n minus h and h again. And you just say there, there are h states orthogonal. 
and you randomly initialize where these age states can be. That's what this permutation does. And then you sort of take the probability, you, you, you sum over all the probabilities of where, just sorry, you take, um, you sort of chop your block up in two, and then you say, okay, well, you can have this many in the first block that are orthogonal and this many in the second block. And then you can compute, can recursively compute how many of these click events there at least have to be. And that's sort of what this theorem says. So we, because we cannot analyze these Koska numbers and these, uh, these numbers that you need for this G test analytically, we, we propose some way to, to compute the performance of, of this swap test. And, and that's what this theorem says here that this, okay, so this swap three again has a perfect uh, completeness. And the, and the soundness is at least one minus some gamma function over this binomial, where this gamma function is, is this recursive, uh, is, is defined by some recursive relation that I described before. Um, yes, but, but it, uh, this recursive relation is somehow not perfect uh, because you, 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 we, we overcount in this way that, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, we can overcount. Um, uh, just curious, is it ever tight? So there will be a case uh, where it will be tight. Yeah, somehow how how we look at it is is we say okay, well let's let's say you have four inputs, right, and and two mm. of them can be orthogonal to the other two. Then, uh, yeah, so, sorry. How this, what this what this thing does? It would just consider that these two states are not orthogonal to each other somehow. If if there's, um, sorry, I'm uh, <laughs> I have we I have an example in the paper where where we where we oh, write okay. that. But, but somehow what the problem is is you can have uh, psi one psi one psi two psi two and psi one psi two psi one psi two, which are two mm -hmm. states where there are both two orthogonal states in them that are orthogonal themselves to each other but the, but the way how this recursive recursion counts it would actually consider those case it, it wouldn't count that as a possible click event case so 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 that's why our uh, re recursion undercounts and that's why we get a lower bound on this uh, soundness probability okay. but ideally you want to count all these cases but counting all these cases you're computing the exact complexity uh, of the, the exact probability of this of this soundness Soundness probability. So in a way, you're also computing these Koska numbers and, and all that stuff, which is, yeah, we know it's it's a hard thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe finding a very easy way to compute all these click events would be difficult implied by our, our theorem. Um, yeah, so that, that was just a little a little sidetrack. I don't know if there's any experimentalist who can tell me whether it's easy to implement this, whether you keep on sort of iteratively do, doing swap tests, but we thought it was sort of a neat, neat protocol. Uh, and yeah, the analysis turned out to be very rich how to how to figure out what the actual performance is of this. So what did we do in this talk? Uh, we were talking about this quantum state identity problem. And, and I think the conclusion you have to draw is that when you know very little about your input and you have the resources, just always do the permutation test because it's always going to be optimal. But you have, you have fewer resources, you can use some restricted G test like the, the circle test or the iterated swap tree. Um, and then if you know a little bit more about your input, like you know the order, but you don't have much resources because you, so you cannot do the permutation test, then you need to can very carefully analyze and, and there might be some optimal group that actually generates all the permutations for you that 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 are possible in in your input distribution. So, for example, if there's just one orthogonal state, this circle test is optimal. But it could be if you have like a more of them, then 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 there might be some better group for you. And you have to analyze what works in that case. But if you have the possibilities, just always do the permutation test. That's uh, that's the conclusion I would I would give you. That's uh, about but, but, uh, 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 Excuse me. Uh, but in any case, uh, the permutation test is the optimal. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if you have uh, abundant re uh, resource, you, you should go for uh, the permutation test. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
So so no, yes. no no matter whether you know the 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 input distribution or not. Yeah, so I mean the permutation test is going to be optimal, but if you know the mm -hmm. input distribution, there might be a restricted G test that is also optimal. Does but, make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. But but you can never uh outperform the permutation test even exactly. though you yes. know some knowledge about the input. Yes. Yes. Okay. That 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 is very okay. It, it's a little bit counter counterintuitive. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So somehow the the theorem says, but yeah, it's really by this the semi-definite program, right? That even if you're gonna do like state tomography on your, you know, you have n of, of like like some set of these states and some set of some other states. I yeah. would intuitively think you might do state tomography and you really learn, and then of the other states you also do state tomography and then you check the two of them. That could be good. But yeah, this permutation works test works so well because this binomial really blows yeah. up it goes super quickly to one and of course you're computing you're comparing two things that are going to be exponentially close to one but yeah this permutation test is going to be best yeah yeah i understand yeah that, that's also the surprising <laughs> yeah the, the yeah. surprising point you you have provide provided right yes i would say so yeah uh okay. so i just want to clarify uh when you say optimal, it's optimal in terms of what? In terms of the measurement time or in terms of the... No, sorry, it's no, no, optimal in that, terms of that, the that, success that, probability. That, that, that success probability. Yes. Yeah. And then how about the the swap test you have to do or the number The swap test is actually the simplest form of the permutation test where you just have two, two input states. Right. Uh-huh. Okay. And you already see, right, in the swap test, you uh, knowing which one is the orthogonal states, that actually doesn't make sense because it sort of swaps around. But yeah, they're, 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 they already yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of this yeah. Okay, so just let me say some open problems and then maybe I can take some more questions. What about, first thing you might think about is what about an approximate version of this quantum state identity problem, right, where they're not exactly orthogonal. Um, uh, we think yeah. we have an idea on, on how to continue with this. Uh, it, it works sort of because this higher measure is going to nicely, if, if, if they're going to be a little bit non-orthogonal, this higher measure might, might get some nice, easy results on, on how to state the problem again. And maybe we can do it again with an STP. Um, and of course the open problem is, is going to be our, like this, this cyclic test, you can compute these cost count numbers. I don't know much about these representation theory things. Maybe there are other groups that generate some some different uh, permutations that have nicely computable cost count numbers and maybe you can can sort of get non-trivial results from this we would like to get an exact expression expression for this performance of the swap tree for that you have to calculate these cost count numbers of the iterated uh, breath test and then there's an interesting problem where it's 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 a completely different problem where your your uh, task would be to you get as an input let's say you're always in this orthogonal case and you get this input uh, with some partition. So you have mu one states that are equal, that are orthogonal to mu two other states, to mu three other states. And there your task is to reconstruct mu. So you want to know how many are there of mu one, how many are there of mu two. Um, and can we use the techniques we have here to, to also solve this problem? It, it's a really separate, separate thing. Uh, we, we might, we, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, then I have some references for you guys uh, to all the papers that I mentioned, and uh, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very interesting. If you interesting have any more topic. questions, <laughs> please let me know. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I, I have a question. Maybe that's too technical, but can we go back to your proof? Uh, because uh, when you, you use a you use the technique of uh, uh, performing the ha uh, random unit tree, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. Here is what I don't understand because uh, your your input is a uh, a pure state. Yeah. And then yeah. So th then why, why why is it just a a, a trick for proof? Then you somehow uh, go go. You 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 sound just just apply uh hard random unitaries and then 
so I, I I don't quite follow what, what what's the point of doing that. Okay, okay, okay. So um, we want to phrase our problem as a semi-definite program. So we de yes. we define this maximization problem, but then we need to define what is this row equal n. So that's when you have n inputs that are all equal, and this row unequal n, where where there's there can be these orthogonal states. Um, so I want to say I just get uh, uh, n n states, but they're in an unknown basis to me. And then we say, okay, well, then I'm going to write down the density matrix. So I'm going to integrate over all unitaries, and that's sort of what an unknown basis means to me. Uh, but does make sense? Uh, actually, we, we we are using some uh, that the input uh, is a, a pure state is a pure state, right? Yeah. You, you just yeah, don't yeah. know what state it is. Yes, uh, exactly. Or you say you, you don't know the basis. Uh, that, yes. That's what you say? Yeah, and I don't know the basis, and I want to write down the density matrix. For what? Because for for me, there is no density matrix. It's a pure state. You 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 just need to apply a U. I agree, but not a random. But but you don't integral over all kinds of U. You know what? But I'm if saying. you write down the the, the density matrix, it, um. So you, this this if this you, is still you do that, then you 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 are you are proof so for every possible input, not not just for a specific input, because our our original question is for a specific input. You you just don't know what that input is. Yeah, exactly. So so the way we model it is by saying we 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 take we don't know what input it is. We take the the higher measure, and then we uh -huh. actually say that if you would take any measure over all uh, unitaries, the the higher measure would be sort of the most difficult one, and the permutation test doesn't care about whatever basis it was in. So sort of the higher measure is the most difficult one. But I'm not sure. Yeah, but for me, then, then it seems you are pro pro you are uh, proving that the permutation test is the uh, is the optimal uh, on average. Not 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 really the optimal for a specific case. Um, right. But yeah, okay. No, no. Of course, if if it is a specific case and you know a little bit more about the basis, it might be better to to measure in that basis, right? No, no. But no, but but we we don't know anything. We we just we we just keep uh say we we can do an experiment and then Ed is just uh keep uh keeps using the same input. And then yeah. uh, she challenged Bob to do that, but but still we uh, he always uh, she always uh, uses uh, the 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 same input. Yeah. Then then there is no ran randomness. There there no no higher measure has been done indeed, but 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 Bob doesn't know what ba basis Alice used, right? That that's true, right? So so that's and... so when I write down the optimization from Bob's point of view. That, mm -hmm. Then, then we write it like this. We we say, okay, well, I don't know what. No, no, what but the... but then your proof is that uh uh, uh th this test is optimal uh on average. If, if then Ed is try to do something else, right? It, it, you you it seems to me you you are proof that if Ed is then change his uh input, uh change mm -hmm. her input, then on average, uh th this is a uh, optimal. Uh, yeah, system. yeah. But 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 I think the original problem is not on average. It, it's just for a fixed input. Um, but the original problem is right this, like this, right? Right. So so the unknown states are uh, psi one and psi n. Right, that uh, those are fixed. Yeah. So Edis should always use those. Yeah. And then he challenged. Uh, then, then she challenged Bob for like a million times. And then Bob need to uh devise a a a test scenario. Uh, no, but you 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 only get these n unknown states once, right? You don't you don't get it multiple times. No, I, I'm saying uh. uh at least we can repeat the same experiment, and then we can really uh, exper ex experimentally measure the probability. So we can repeat this scenario a lot of times. So at least can uh, repeat 
uh, sending uh, the same uh, the the same unknown state the same state unknown to 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 Bob. But if Bob but would keep should, this, right? But 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 Ed is uh, is not allowed to change his inputs. Okay. If she is allowed, then then that's what you are uh, proving because you you can say then on average Bob the Bob device the optimal uh, yeah scenario of yes. on average. I see. I think I see your point. Yeah. So you can see it like that. Like Alice is allowed to change her states, but I see it more as like you're just playing one round. So you're not playing. Alice is not going to send again the same states later. Uh, you're just. It's the one. The one shot you get. I think probably uh, we. Uh, you you can uh, explain what's the STP program. For I mean, there are you you are saying uh, for the original problem there are two cases and the second case there are several different sub -case cases, and mm -hmm. there are cases that are unitary are unknown, and the law equal case uh, is corresponding to case one or some subset of the case two like for unitary is unknown. Yes. So so this so, row equal case. Here is when when all the inputs are equal, right? So you get n quantum states that are all equal. They're all in the one state, but then a random unit, the same random unitary, is applied to all of these n quantum states. Yes. So I think uh, his question is probably uh, what's the integration here means? Because when you integrate, then it's not only one state. Then what's no, the it, the, the integration it comes from this density matrix formalism, right? So from Bob's point of view, he doesn't know. It's like if you would send somebody a BB84 state, it's of course zero, one, plus or minus. But from point of view of someone who doesn't know the state, it's like a an equal mixture, right, of the density matrices. Yes. And and in this case, you're you're just generalizing it, and you're saying, okay, well, it's an equal mixture if you don't know the basis of all possible bases, and that's actually this higher integral. Then what does the first term in the SDP primal program mean? The first term? It you mean this? The, yes. So you, so what, what I'm interested in is finding POVM, a POVM set, so P equal and P unequal. And they have to be a POVM, so they have to be positive matrices. And they have to sum up to identity. And this first term here is saying the probability of answering equal, so measure P equal, that's having measurement outcome equal when the input was equal. That's what this thing means. And the second thing means the probability of measuring unequal when the input was unequal. So the maximization is over all possible POVM, right? Yeah, Finding it's over all POVM. POVMs. I want to just maximize these two things. So this first thing is the probability of getting equal, which I assumed for this proof to be a half, but you can make it different. And then you get row equal, and then you want to measure equal on row equal. Yeah, probably I think uh, for the uh, density matrix, which is just one specific or is from some average, the two cases will find different POVM and the two cases will like give you the same, the exact same result. That, that's my my case. No, so this, the, the, the P equal and P unequal are related. Here because they have to sum up to identity and they both have to be positive. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you cannot pick a different. So when, whenever you pick a P equal here, it restricts whatever P unequal you can pick here. And in particular, actually, when you have a POVM set with just two measurements, um, yeah, P unequal is going to be identity minus P equal. So whenever you pick P equal, you're 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 also picking P unequal. Yeah, yes, I, I agree. I, but what I mean is that uh, for like. Uh, uh, the, when we go back to the original question, 
Yeah. Uh, the, the when there is average. No, no, no. I I just stay in the SDP part. Okay. Sorry. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, for raw equal when there is inter integration over you or or just specific without uh integration, the two cases will find different uh set of P -O -E -N. PLVN, and the two sets will give you the same result. That's why I guess. But uh, never mind. I I don't have any. any yeah, so uh, can, can, can you, I, I guess, to ask something? The problem is, uh, Baba Bar is not allowed to know uh, what uh, the input is. So yes. So for for Baba, uh, from uh, from the point of view of Baba, it, it it's behave like a density matrix. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So to speak, right? But but then uh, from the point of Alice, you can argue that uh, it's, it's like a pure state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you yeah, would know yeah, the right. basis. So, so, so yeah. I guess uh, what, what this is doing is uh, to do from the point of view of Bob. Right? Yes, yes. So, yeah. And then you can already see that this thing can, for example, never be one. That's maybe also an, I mean, it's not super easy to see, but this row equal and this row unequal state. They're never orthogonal to each other. You need to do some math for it, but these two states cannot be orthogonal. So there cannot be a perfect discrimination between the two. And that's that's really why this task comes up. Like, what is then the best one? Okay. And that's what and makes can, this can you, primal non-trivial. Can, can you elaborate a little bit more? Why, why you need to uh, convert the, the prime, uh, primal program into the dual program? And yeah. what the dual program is? Because for me, the primal program is very close to a, a, a SDP, right? Or, or yeah, not. yeah, so this is an SDP, right? So you have a, this primal and this ju and so this is the primal problem here on the left. Right, and, the, and it is in the SD, SDP form, right? Yeah, yes, exactly. And then, yeah, you, then, then you why don't you these, just Right. This is the dual. The, the, on the right here, this is the dual problem this is for this using primal weak problem. duality. In order to prove the optimality. Yeah, so weak That's duality. The, the oh, okay. Weak duality says that P is smaller equal than than that your primal, any solution to your ah. primal is smaller than any solution to your dual. That's what weak duality oh, says. See. That's always true. And then I okay, find okay. a solution in my primal and a solution in my dual that are the same. Okay. But then it but then it must be the correct value because I know my correct value is in between these two things, and I I find them to be exact. It's sort of a, a, a nice trick with these SDPs if you find these points, but finding these points is very difficult. So this oh. is where you say it is optimal, right? Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Uh, okay. I wanted to ask like a clarifying question earlier. So yeah. okay. So let let's say you have like the n input states, right? So I do a permutation test, then I get some success probability, right? Uh, then now let me do it differently. Now, when I get the input states, let me apply a random unitary to all of them, the same random yeah. unitary, then yeah. perform the permutation test. Yeah. I would get the same success probability, right? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah. that's actually my, my question. So yeah. it seems uh, you are, your proof applied to the second scenario. Yes, but for for me, th th these are two different scenarios. I see. I see. Yeah. Right. But, but, I, think, but maybe I think maybe the they, point they, is they, like they you, you get the, the same, same success probability. So right. So so but, maybe they but, but strictly be speaking, the, the solution but, but, but is you different. You need to make some argument for that because these two are really two different scenarios. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we do that. We that I, I didn't go into it too much, but yeah, that's that we, we show that this higher measure is the, is the hardest measure and the permutation test is still optimal over the higher measure. So in a way, what you can do if you if you get it, if your unitary would be over some different measure, you can just do the higher measure, then do the permutation test and it doesn't matter for the pro, success. Oh, okay, probability. okay. Mm. Okay, so 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 before uh, Eddie's uh, send uh, the state to the bar, uh, we, we can also apply uh, a random unitary. Yeah, yeah, you could also okay. see it like that. Yeah. Okay, and, and then Bob still uses the same uh, permu yeah. uh, permutation yeah. test. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I got it. 
Okay. Maybe you can see like there's some adversary that that's only allowed to do the same random unitary to all the states. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that and then it doesn't matter I mean, for like, your success probability. Yeah, I think like earlier you did mention like the intuition is sort of like anyway I don't know like what is sort of the correct basis in which to do the the thing. Yeah, so I think the intuition somehow, is that because yeah, we, because yeah. we yeah. don't know anyway. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, I, got okay. It. Yeah, I guess we sort of had an extended discussion, but at least it yeah, thanks for that. Lots of things. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I have a quick question. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, so I want to ask, uh, do, in your uh, SDP program, you, you, do you need to specify the partition mu? Uh, it, it's for arbitrary partition or it's just for okay. specific given partition? So the, 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 the STP assumes a specific partition, but mm -hmm. then you can write this STP for all the possible partitions. And then mm -hmm. you see that for all possible partitions, the permutation test is best. And so in your jewel, you need to, in your jewel, you're sort of using what this partition is to find this, to find this point, but your primal doesn't use anything of this partition. And because so for every partition, the permutation test is best. The permutation test doesn't use any information about the partition. It means that this information about the partition is sort of useless. Yes. Okay. So, so in your proof, you need to actually go through all possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you you sort of write down all these these STPs. So yeah, you you we find a general point in your jewel that 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 uses this partition, and then you can show that for every partition, it's the optimal point in the jewel. Yes. Uh, and you said you you uh the the two law equal and law unequal are like uh orthogonal or or not orthogonal. You you have to clarify. You have to. Yeah, so they're, they're actually they're not orthogonal, that. these two states. And that's precisely why the permutation test is not absolutely perfect and why the swap test is not absolutely perfect. And it's because of this non-orthogonality between the two states. Yeah. If they are not orthogonal, then what, how, how do you check uh, in, in your proof? Uh, you, you need to find out the orthogonality or you need to find out. No, I, I, I don't need to do anything, no. but it's just an intuitive thing to why uh, you cannot distinguish the two states with probability one, because if you distinguish with probability one, it's only possible if the states are orthogonal. I see, I see, okay. Oh, for n equal to two, it, it is, right? Um, no, the swap test is not perfect, right? The swap test works with probability three quarters. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so, sorry, uh, another, like, a side question, uh, another different question. And so, in, in, you, you say, uh, you, if you combine all possible swap tests between any pair and, uh, hierarchy, uh, do more swap tests, yeah, like this. And yes, yes, iterative swap tree. Uh, is it does it help if you like uh, find out some swap tests already give you like unequal result? And can you? Yeah, yeah. So whenever one stuff? swap test gives you an equal, you can already stop because you know that you're in the case where they're not all equal. Yes. Okay. Because okay. whenever the swap test answers unequal, you know that the inputs were unequal. Whenever the swap test answers equal. It could be both. I see. I see. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. 